and uh, we should be live. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to uh, wherever you are. Welcome to uh, Google Earth and Education Hangout with uh, myself, Thomas Peacher, and Jerome Berg. Welcome. And uh, we're going to be sharing uh, information that we have learned in our well, four or five years, at least, working with uh, Google Earth. And uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of things about our websites, Google Lit Trips, and Real World Math. And just some ideas and strategies for using Google Earth in education. So uh, before we get started, let me just say that if you have any comments or questions, that you can add them in the Google Plus page underneath the post there. And the best way to do this is to have two windows open. One window is where you're going to be viewing the Hangout, and then the other window you can uh, follow the chat stream for that. Now the chats do not refresh automatically, so if you want to you know, keep up with the conversation, then that se that second window, uh, you're just going to refresh that, and then you'll see the the chats and comments that come in. And I know Jerome and I would uh, love to hear uh, who's with us today and where you're from. So if you could enter a comment underneath the post there and uh, let us know where, who you are, where you're from. Uh, that would be great, and maybe we can make some more connections today. Uh, the other thing that I would like to start off with is, let me get this going. The other thing I'd like to start off with is that, uh, okay, so where you see the yellow box there, that's where you can add your comments or questions, and Jerome and I will be monitoring that. Uh, we'll check on that a couple of times during the presentation. Also, uh, if you want to follow us on Twitter, these are our, our, um, uh, our, our Twitter addresses. And the hashtags for this event, for all the uh, EduOnAir ones, is hashtag EduOnAir. And this event in particular is hashtag EarthEDU. All right, so uh, actually before we get to that one, Jerome, why don't we, um, why don't we have you introduce yourself and um, just give us an idea of uh, who you are and what you do. Okay, so uh, Jerome Berg, Google Certified Teacher. Uh, I was lucky enough to get into the pilot program, so I didn't have as much competition for getting selected as uh, many people did. But uh, if any of you are Google Certified Teachers, you know that you were asked to do a, uh, a, a couple of advocacy projects. And when they showed me Google Earth, the first thing I thought of was, yeah, I wonder if I could track some of the great literature, Grapes of Wrath, Candy, Make Way for Ducklings, whatever, on Google Earth and uh, call that an advocacy. And I did that and it exploded on me. And so uh, as I was walking out the door, uh, retiring after 38 years of teaching high school English, I found myself with um, a project that was uh, changing my retirement plans significantly, <laughs> so to speak. So what I do is I track great literature. I think I have a slide uh, later on that, that tells that. And uh, so, you know, Google Earth-based literature trips is what it's all about. Um, about for 38 years. 30, 38 years, and a, and a new grandpa too, right? A new grandpa, yes. I, oh. uh, my, I uh, had my grandson count raised from one to three on October 3rd when little Ian and Henry popped into the world, and they're all living with us. Well, congratulations. Thank you. So my name is Thomas Petra, and I'm uh, actually I'm broadcasting right now from the island of Guam, and I've been out here for... Uh, over 20 years, and I've uh, mainly been in the field of uh, math education. I've taught math to all, all different levels, elementary, middle, high school, and some uh, uh, college college math, too. And uh, I don't know about, I guess it's all, it's all started like five years or so ago when I got a master's degree in uh, educational technology. And uh, the, my master's project was the website realworldmath.org, and that's actually how uh, Jerome and I first got acquainted. Um, but I'm also a Google certified teacher and a Google Apps for Education uh, certi certified trainer. And uh, overall, I just do like uh, um, technology integration specialist uh, role as present presentations and uh, development and so on. But currently, I'm I'm doing something different this year. I'm working in the field of special education as an assistive technology teacher. 
So, um, you know, always learning something new. But um, Jerome, let's let's go back to when this all began. And I, I think you started your website. Was it five years ago? Was it in two thousand eight? Early early two thousand eight. Tell us about tell us about Google Lit Trips. Well, <clears throat> I uh, I wanted to give all of this stuff away. I I, I decided. Well, I'm a, I'm going to retire. I'll do a couple of Lit Trips and offer them to my forward-thinking colleagues on the way out the door. And I, some of you probably know uh, Carol Ann McGuire. She's a Google certified teacher, Alpha Distinguished Educator, and a wonderful person. I shared this with her, told her I just wanted to give it away. It was kind of something I was playing around with. Uh, in January of 2000, uh, I think that was seven, and she said, you have to go get a website so that you have a place to give it away, and I want you to do it tonight. And I really wasn't thinking of it being a major project or anything. I was just gifting some high school buddies. And so I went home, and I, I came up with the name Google Lit Trips, mostly as a joke, because I thought, well, if people want to know about Steinbeck, and I'd say, hey, what would you do if you wanted to know about Grapes of Wrath? Well, I'd Google it, and then I play on Google Lit. Oh, you know my website. I wasn't too terribly serious about it becoming a major project, but it got discovered and um, it got discovered and blogged about by Will Richardson, who uh, has a huge following. And within three months of putting the website out, even though there were only five people who knew the address, when Will Richardson found it and blogged about it. The uh, visitor account went up to almost a thousand a day for a month of visitors, and I only had two lit trips that was ready to go. And in the first week, well, not in the first week, about the first month, I got two amazing emails that opened my eyes. One was from a college professor uh, who thought it was great, and he want, he wanted to uh, bring it into his teacher prep courses, and he wanted to build one. Actually, he wanted to build one on uh, on uh, Dante's Inferno, and I had to tell him that Google hasn't yet mapped hell. But, uh, <laughs> it was interesting. And in the same week, I got one from a first grade teacher, and her kids had done one. And I thought, I never even thought of it having a mass appeal all the way up to grade levels, and it did. And so. Um, I've had, I think, 1.6 million visitors to the site since March of 2007, and uh, it's become kind of a global phenomenon, keeping me out of trouble in my retirement. That's, that's, for sure. that's incredible. You have over a million. Yeah. Uh, I want to get into that some more later on as far as like um, just kind of how this has changed your, your life, I think, you know, probably having the website. but. Um, so my website, if you're not familiar with it, is is one for it centers around uh, math, and and uh, as I said before, that was for a, a master's project that, that I was doing, and I went I went looking first on the internet to see if anybody else had created you know something like this because I want to do something new, and no one had done math, but I found Google Lit Trips, and so um, uh, you know I reached out to Jerome and asked for advice and stuff on how to you know get it get it going. But um, so uh, real world math is is math lessons and activities that are in you know based in uh, put in Google Earth. And so uh, rather than like an instruction, it's it's not it's not really the things that I create aren't really there to instruct the students. It's for them to use what they know already, you know uh, the base knowledge that they come in with to give them somewhere where they can actually like apply it. And somewhere that's more interesting than having a worksheet or uh, you know homework list of questions to do. So that's uh, you know I wanted to present math in a different way. And you know back um, 2008 or so that this was happening, I didn't I wasn't finding anything on the internet you know that I really really liked for math at the time. And so uh, uh, it's great to see how things have have changed in just this short amount of time. Really see to see how it has grown. I, I just did a, a reboot of the whole website and re, um, transformed everything into a new uh, new host and all that now. And so, um, 
the website has different sections in it for, for students and for teachers also. There's a teacher access page that's got, um, you can request the password for free and then uh, you get access to that content uh, on the website. So uh, I think we're going to talk about our lessons and uh, just kind of like what what we try to do when we create material for Google Earth. So for your lit trips, Jerome, what is it that, you know, in general, for all the, all the things when you create something, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? Uh, let's see. That's a great question. Can we uh, jump to slide number six? Sure. The most important thing to me is what I'm trying not to accomplish. And what I'm trying not to accomplish is a, another version of SparkNotes, some place where kids can go and be told what the probable right answers are to the probable questions that will be on the test. Um, what I really want to do is move, uh, as Thomas said, I want to move into sort of a new approach. What does geography have to do with literature? What does math have to do with literature? Uh, what is art? What, you know, they, they live in a world that isn't necessarily well reflected in the classrooms where they learn about the world. And so what, what I'd like to do is work on what, what literature is really about. And again, I know probably a lot of people out there aren't literature people, but coming from that point of view, I'm saying, well, what do I, want to, what do I want my kids to engage in? I don't want them to engage in a uh, treasure hunt for the right answers to the questions. I want them, I want them to engage in the literature itself and in the, in the truths and the cultural uh, wisdom that's represented in, in great literature. And so what I thought is, yeah, and I've been calling this a kind of uh, read-along, write-along, as in as kids are reading through a book, they can ride right along with the characters. They can be right in the back seat of the car in the Grapes of Wrath. They can be waddling right behind the, the duckling family and make way for, for ducklings. They can, be, uh, they can be flying through the Kyber Pass with uh, Amir and the Kite Runner as though they are right there. And if they are there looking through the windshield, or even worse, if they're in the cattle car with Elie Wiesel go in, in his book, Night, going to the concentration camps, it's, it's what we call in storytelling suspension of disbelief. Like when you go into a movie, you, know, you, you sit there and you suspend disbelief when the lights go out and you're in the scene. Well, I want them reading the book from within the story. I want them sitting right next to the characters. I want them thinking about the issues and finding connections to their own lives. I really want them engaging in the story. And I think the next slide, uh, well, well wait. The, the slide that's up, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, when, when you know, it's kind of funny how we, we both kind of have the same, uh, the same kind of uh, approach, I guess, is uh, we both had kind of a similar diagram for this when we were like sharing some information. And, and uh, yeah, really, this is the, the, the kind of the, the key to my paper and stuff too when I, when I wrote it for the master's project is, you know, there are three things, three areas really that I was trying to address. And one is um, like you have uh, how people learn. And I think that's that, you know, one thing with Google Earth is that it, it addresses all the different types of learning styles. You know, some stu some students are better at uh, they're visual learners or they're tactile learners or you know, you go into the uh, multiple intelligences from Gardner and you know that sort of thing. Especially in in math, it's just some students that don't want to sit and just do pencil on paper math. And so to prevent to um, present them a different alternative is like oh you know I've had some students that just like oh my gosh they're just so happy to to do something other than you know uh, pages of of math homework. Uh, and then the other thing that that I see you have that I do, you know, I, I was doing too, is mo a modern approach uh, using technology to to do something that's, you know, was more traditionally on um, paper. And and so Google Earth in particular, what Google Earth can can do or bring to that. And then the third one you have uh, globalization. Do you want to talk about that one? Well, you know, if you're engaged in the, in the whole conversation about educational reform in the 21st century, we're really talking about uh, the flat earth. We're talking about uh, 
globalizing the kids' awareness, they do not live in their neighborhoods. Uh, well, they hardly live in their neighborhoods at all anymore compared to all of the virtual neighborhoods that they've become parts of with Facebook and all of these other places. And, and in the workplace, the same thing is happening. Everything's being globalized. And so uh, the kids need to know that they are members of the whole global community. And if they are, then maybe they ought to know a little bit about it. And so I, I do want to stop and interrupt just to say, if you are adding comments or following the stream, please remember to uh, refresh your screen every once in a while. I have a few comments, but um, I'm hoping to get a few more. And for the person who mentioned that they're starting night next week, you might be happy to know that that has um, uh, been very recently updated. And so it's really fresh. So if you have the old version, get the new one. <laughs> oh. um, you know, the other thing about globalization, uh, you know, that I was thinking about, and it, it's kind of the, uh, it, it's, it's so obvious that we're not addressing it is that uh, it's the context of having the earth, of having a virtual earth in front of you. You know, you know my, my, my website name is kind of pretty much a cliche, like real world math. Um, but I mean, really, it's real world math. Like in context, what kind of math takes place on the earth? That's the kind of things that I, that I you know, when the kids want to know, like, where, when are we ever going to use this kind of math? I try to put them in that situation. Like, okay, here's when you might want to use that kind of, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, formula or any kind of, like, uh, uh, math skill. So it's the context of having the earth and seeing the relationship of the globe and, and uh, not seeing it on a flat map kind of screen. I think that's really, really important, and we're going to talk about sh even shifting that paradigm of uh, what Google Earth can bring to putting everything in its context. Um, but it's the world they live in. It's the it's the workplace they live in. It's the geography they live in. But geography is just the small right answer. The real right answer is everywhere. All these places have cultures, and they have uh, different traditions, and and we have to figure out a way not only to compete with them for business, but to cooperate with them and to collaborate with people around the world. And so when, when people read literature or when they're going on history uh, trips um, on Google Earth, they know where they are. I like one of the things on Google Earth, by the way, I'll stick in, is there, there are places where, like New York Times, I think, is down in the layer or someplace. And you can read the New York Times, but you fly to the location where the story is set. And so, oh, now I know where I am. Oh, this is Afghanistan. And now I'm reading the headlines. Although when I last demonstrated that in a uh, presentation, I flew to my hometown, read, opened up the hometown newspaper, where there was an article about some pedophile or something that had been arrested. So that wasn't a very good example. But anyway, being where you are studying virtually is a wonderful sort of subtle difference in the kids' minds. Is this the paradigm uh, shift that you're talking about then? The slide is what you want to... Right, right. And, you know, we, we sometimes talk about uh, schools being organized, particularly in high schools, uh, in sort of silos. The history department at my high school had their own building. The English department had their own building. The math department had their own building. We didn't even have to talk to each other. And we didn't even, we didn't even have to discuss what it was that the kids had to do um, that had anything to do with the other curriculum areas. There's science and math in Grapes of Wrath. There is... Uh, there is history in Animal Farm. There's all kinds of stuff, and yet we weren't tying it together. We were just in our silos. And one thing that has me a little bit bothered, although I happen to be pro-accountability, both for educators and our students, our basic accountability assessment structures right now are still built on that silo effect. You take a reading test, and all you have to do is know what the reading stuff is, you take a math test, you take a test in a curricular area as though they were independent and they're not. And so that slide that Tom had up a few moments ago where I have a picture of the globe uh, 
with little circles, everything is overlapping in the in the, in the world now. The the uh, you know I might be working in a place where my bookkeeping people happen to be in Asia, and my marketing people might happen to be in New York City, and my design people might happen to be in South America. And so I, and knowing a little bit about their cultures is kind of a nice thing, and knowing a little bit about their location is sort of a nice thing, and knowing a little bit about what my job has to do with the math department. How many of us in English in, in, in classrooms have a really deep understanding of the, the budgets that our administrators have to juggle? Or how many of us know teachers yeah, I, I was going to say that. They just think I, you didn't get enough money. I was going to say that, yeah, I really relate to that. I, that's a point I make a lot is that, is that uh, math and science used to be really like the same thing. I mean, back, you know, I don't know, hundreds of years ago, like math and science was, it was in one. And then at some point, it got separated. And that, that was the math classroom and that was the science classroom. But, you know, things like math and science, especially, are so related. Uh, and that when I, you know, on my website, when I have the lessons or activities, you know, I started to think, you know, I put it down and I thought, well, you know, they could use this in science class too, or they could use this in English class, they could do something for it. So I started listing like kind of cross, cur cross curricular, you know, opportunities with the different things that I had. And then sometimes I just found that it was just, I was sharing, you know, it was like every subject, like you could do anything with this. You could have math in it, you could do English. So, you know, this is one that's, I guess it's kind of relevant too, or timely. <laughs> Uh, you know, I have one activity that's a tsunami warning, and it, and it dealt with the Indian Ocean tsunami back in 2000 and, uh, 2008. I'm not trying to remember when that was, but you know, the, the Indian Ocean tsunami, and uh, and the math activity itself is is basically just uh, distance equals rate times time. You know, it's a formula that the, the math students use a lot, but put it in the context of of how find out how fast the waves are traveling to different points across the Indian Ocean. How fast did the wave travel to this location? How fast did the wave travel to that location? Why isn't it, why is it different? Why are there, why are there different speeds for the waves? When I, when I do, when I create something, I, I don't, you know, I, I, I think Dan Meyer is a, a mathematician who really hits on this really well, is, you know, it's not just to put out the obvious answer to them or direct them to the obvious question even. Is is just put things kind of open ended and give them things to think about, give them things to to work with, uh, and and have them make those connections because that's more personal learning, personalized learning, active learning. Those are the kind of things that I, that I really are trying to encourage when I when I make things. Uh, you know, the tsunami warning in itself could you know could be a science lesson, math lessons, and you could do things for English and history and so on, and and then that globalization that. Awareness of the world. The world is much smaller than it than it used to be. You know, the time it takes for us to get in touch with someone in South America, or uh, you know, uh, just connecting with anybody in anywhere else in the globe now is just instantaneous almost. And so, uh, yeah, it's that globalization that 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 part you had in that um, that Venn diagram before is is really something that I like to embrace also. Uh, let me stick in a little bit about the comments. Uh... Thomas, <clears throat> Nicole, Good. I think you got an answer to the hashtag. That's only one of the hashtags at earth.edu. Um, it seems to me we can all collect there if people want to want to just send them all there. Um, the other thing I'm noticing here, someone mentioned that when they refresh to see the comments, it stops the, the uh, video. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I was saying. Uh, you know, really the best way to do it is to have two windows. So you open a new window, and one window you're refreshing to do the comments, and the other window you're watching the video, and it doesn't get interrupted that way. And you know that's a that's just a Google Plus thing. It would be nice if they could work around that uh, better for these these on-air broadcasts. And, and you know, again, this is really new. Google Plus has just been around for uh, a little over a year. Really, the the on-air version is a uh, is uh, really new. So, yeah, that's the way to get around that. I I totally uh, I feel your pain. <laughs> Uh, Thomas, could you go back to slide seven just for a quick comment? Sure. All right, here it is. When I show this slide, um, I I don't use the word literature and I don't use the word Google Earth. I use 
literature is the wisdom of the ages. It's been articulated throughout history and every culture uh, in stories. I mean, we all know about the cave people who sat around the fires telling, telling their stories. And it's the stories, the fictional stories that ironically sometimes have the greatest human truths to them. And if you take that and mix it with a modern technology that takes mapping to a whole new level, then when I show this slide, I actually hide the word engaged and it says relevant learning. Well, the problem is I don't know a teacher who doesn't believe that what they're up in front of a classroom or on the side of the classroom or wherever they are teaching, they know it's relevant. The question is it's not relevant to the kids until they perceive that it's relevant. And so our job is selling the relevance and if we do then they become engaged and every one of us has also seen that once a kid is engaged in anything it's relevant and and an awful lot of the a, a lot of the issues that they have sort of vanish in terms of resistance or feeling like they're not good in math or not good in English or something like that so I really believe sell the engagement and then they will see the relevance. And once they see the rele relevance, it's hard to stop them, which is um, because they, th they think it's about something they care about. Um, so that's all I wanted to say about that slide. OK, well, why don't we get into the kind of the nuts and bolts now of, of uh, creating things for Google Earth and uh, what, it takes, what it takes to put something in, uh, uh, to put some uh, content in Google Earth, or how to use the controls. Now, I want to, it's not going to be all the controls and stuff, but when when you create material for Google Earth, what are the what are the sort of things that you are trying to key in on, or how do you how do you want to present it? You want to you want to start that first? Well, you know, um, this may not be where you're going, Tom, but but let me start this, and then you can either sort of take back where you wanted to. Uh, I start with what's happening in, in good teaching pedagogy. And I think that what's happening is an awful lot is uh, of co current practice is obsoleting and being replaced by this whole technology impact. And so in this slide that, that uh, Tom has up on the screen now, I tell people I dedicated my project to Mr. K, who was my senior English teacher. And I graduated uh, in high school. I graduated in 1960, a long time ago. And he used maps when we read Grapes of Wrath. He had Xeroxed the map, and he had Xeroxed it so many years in a row that um, it was hard to see what it was. But it didn't look too much unlike this map right here. And that happens to be uh, sort of an S-curve uh, uh, as part of the journey that, that, that the Jodes took. If I just say, OK, move it to technology, there's that S-curve. And my question is, have I gained anything? Have I actually taken this wonderful idea that Mr. K had that, that brought geography to literature and gave me a context, a geographical context, have I gained by doing this instead of this? And the truth of the matter is, they're both old paradigms. Oh, you know what? I'm moving my arrow over here as though you're seeing my arrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is the right slide, though, right? Yes, that is. So the one on the left is, is sort of like what Mr. K did, and the one in the center is, is well, that's Google Earth. But they're both old paradigms. They're both a bird's eye view. No human being tends to see the world they live in from a bird's eye view. They are both uh, the, they are both textureless. I can't see the land. I can't feel it. And they both have what we're all used to with maps. The north is at the top, and west is uh, on the sort of left edge. So you can see uh, if that map went further to the left, you'd be in California. I think we're in New Mexico now. And if we went further to the right, we'd be back in Oklahoma where the story t started. But to tell you the truth, the center picture from Google Earth, to me, is worse. It's less effective. Oh, it's photographically much more accurate. But I, I can see less detail, and I'm still trapped in the same bird's eye view, textureless point of view, not 
uh, the the uh, North uh, default is there, there really isn't a pedagogical shift using the center one. But the one on the right is also Google Earth. And what's happening on the one on the right is, well, wait a minute, Google Earth can do something that paper maps can't do. First of all, they can zoom from a global view down to a regional view down to a, a local view. It used to take three different maps to do that. But what happens now is I can reorient. So in that third picture on the on the right, west is at the top of the map. And, and if it were larger, you could see that S-curve going towards the horizon. And when it goes towards the horizon, suddenly I feel time. I am looking through the windshield of that old jalopy right now. And the future is in front of me. And if we can get through this terrain, which looks pretty desolate, and I can see 3D, then the story might have a happy ending if we don't get from there here to there, because this old jalopy is barely holding together, then we might have a tragic en ending. And I'll, I see a sense of time here, because I can see the future. And so all of a sudden I'm thinking, it can bring something to the engagement that just maps and just stories weren't able to bring together. So I try to put them in the middle of the story, three-dimensionalizing the experience. That's great. It's, uh, you know, uh, we're talking about context before, and now this is scale. You know, with Google Earth, it's not just one view from above. You can go down, you can zoom in as close as you want or as far back as you want, and to have movement in a lesson, to have that uh, kind of a dynamic lesson like that, I think is, is a lot more uh, engaging for the students. Um, so it's context, scale, and perspective. That, like you're saying, the map can be rotated. They can look at other things. When I when I have things, I when I do lessons or activities, I want the students to to look around. When they're when they're in Google Earth, I yes. want them to to explore. I, I don't say like, no, don't go over there, don't do this. So I have, uh, for instance, one that's um, a Diderot, and it's um, uh, the the students play the role of doing. They have their own uh, dog sled and they do the Iditarod dog sled race and this is I think that I have this under like project-based learning it, it, it takes uh, you know several weeks to do and and, it, and and but in class though it only take like 10 minutes or so because I, I would have the students uh, they'd kind of calculate they'd have some factors and they'd, uh, things would be thrown at them and stuff and, and they would do their dog sled from one checkpoint to the next checkpoint but all along the way, I had all kinds of inf background information about a lot. I'm, in, you know, again, I'm on Guam, so we don't do a lot of dog sled racing here, and they don't know much about Alaska or snow or things like that. And so, you know, just adding layers, layers to the learning for them is um, just history and 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 um, cultures and things like that, and show them. Show them math, and you know, I, if some of them they'd be doing it, and then they, they wouldn't even like realize, like, oh wait, I'm doing math. Like, you know, that's that's kind of the ultimate compliment is to have them like doing something that they're interested in, and then say, well, you know, go over your math again, and they're like, oh, oh, that's right, they kind of forgot that they were even doing math. So, that, to me, that that was kind of a, a, a affirmation that I was being successful with with things like that. You know, that, that's interesting you said that because I, I did journalism for a long time and we ran it as a business. We actually made enough money that I didn't take a budget from my principal. And um, I, I, suddenly I realized is they forget they're in school. They forget that they're learning because they're so interested and engaged in uh, the journey that, that they're on, trying to produce this thing and get the reaction. And, and all of that stuff. I frequently, in my presentations, use the term because I, you know, on Google Lit Trips, I keep a extended metaphor going. I say we're going to take a little side trip, or I tell teachers who download them, you know, many of you have been to these places and you have your own photos. Take a side trip. Say, listen, it's not on the it's not on the Lit Trip, but you know what? A little bit off to the left here, uh, there's a really interesting place. Let's just zoom over there for a while, or the kids can do that, and. Um, it's really kind of neat. I don't want them sitting looking at something te that is teaching at them. So, um, I, do you, I, I like to do you want to go into? Do you want to go into how you put information in the in the pop-up windows or? 
Well, if you're talking, I, I, I'm less interested in the technology, you know, how to do it technologically, because I, the last couple of slides have a whole uh, a bunch of references for tutorials of that sort of how to actually do the technology. But the design of the pop-up I'd like to talk about. Um, I, I think, this I think the, more maybe the design of the lesson. You know, going back to, I guess we're still on pedagogy. We're doing a lot about pedagogy today. Uh, and so, you know, I think I, I know where you're going with, with some of these things. It's, it's not just, you know, you don't just have like fill in the blank questions here. No. In Google Earth because that's just, you know, I mean, why use why use Google Earth in that way? I mean, you, you're you aiming higher, right? Right, right. So I just meant I don't want to go into HTML coding and that's yeah, what yeah. So when I design it, um, I generally have three basic elements, some sort of media. This this pop-up right now, which you probably can't read, it's it's. I tried to enlarge it, but uh, I can just sort of tell you what's going on. The other left-hand corner, this is Kite Runner, and... Uh, in the Kite Runner, there is a scene where they stone this woman to death. That's their form of capital punishment. They they uh, dig a hole and bury you up to your waist, and then they throw a white sheet over you, and then they throw rocks until the sheet is red, and it stops moving, and, this, and, and there's no screaming. It's a horrific sort of form of capital punishment. So... Kids can read text and, and not necessarily get that shocking description. Uh, so if there's a video, I'm very fond of putting uh, enhancing videos in, but it's not telling you the story. It's making you sort of engage in what's there. So just to the right of that, there's just two little page references so that when a kid is stopping at this place mark, uh, at least they have, uh, everybody can be on the same page. This is that scene. Well, it turns out they do their scene, their, they do their, their uh, stoning at halftime in their national sport. And so they're all there cheering for their team. And then at halftime they bring people out and they stone them to death and dig them out and sweep the field and carry on with the second half. And so the, the discussion starters, and I don't, I don't call them questions, although in a sense they they frequently are questions. It's what can we talk about? I don't I don't want to know what color Holden's hat was. Now I might want to know why it was red because there's symbolism there. But I, I want the deeper questions. And so the truth of the matter is, if people try to if kids try to uh, understand the reading without having done it through lit trips they'll be lost because there's questions like um, uh, you know just before this scene there was a very very funny scene where these two kids are telling jokes and then it immediately trans transitions almost shockingly into this grotesque execution scene how does that amplify the grotesqueness when you're laughing in a second the author wants you laughing before he wants you crying to amplify it. And then we talk about juxtaposition of, of things and how really great stories are, are told. Um, there are things, one of, the, one of the kids is rich and he's telling, he's teasing the other kid who's in a different cast. And he's joking like kids do, but it gets out of hand. And then the question is, has that happened in your life where just like a mirror, you sort of thought you were having fun. You thought nobody was getting hurt, but uh, kind of got out of hand. This does happen in the real world, in your world. And what do you think Amir should have done about it? Have you ever had to deal with, realize, oh, man, I shouldn't have said that. I didn't realize you were taking it that way. How do you make amends for things uh, if you weren't thoughtful enough to prevent uh, such, you know, human problems in the first place? Down towards the bottom of that uh, pop-up window, there were two links. And one link was to a wonderful pro and con uh, website on capital punishment. And so what I ask kids to do is, you know, I don't care whether you're for or against it. Here's a challenging question. What's the best argument on the other side that you at least say, you know, 
I can understand that. I, 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 I don't necessarily buy that as convincing me for or against capital punishment, but I can understand how intelligent thinking people might find that uh, an important argument. And I really feel like if I'm going to argue against it, I ought to have respect for other people's opinions. And so I'm just trying to put them in the same situations that the characters find and then enhance it with real world references to, to, um, you know, websites about, in this case, about capital punishment and, um, my notes are so small huh, that I can't even see what the second is. Well, why don't we, uh, let me take a, uh, Go ahead. I have a, there's a question here from uh, Danielle um, saying that she's a total newbie to all this. Are lit trips prepackaged by you and other educators? Is there an opportunity for students to create their own lit trips from the lit that they read? Um, so uh, let me answer the question for you. How about? <laughs> sure. That's because I, I really like, that's one of the things I really like about your website is that you have users contribute to it. You have other people you know, other other teachers have made lit trips and submitted to you, and then you post it. And, and I know your it's a your website and my website. All the contents is, is free. It's it's um, open source software or open source lessons content for people to use. And uh, you've got a large number of lessons that have been uh, contributed from others and even students, right? I do. Um, however, you know, you have to know that. Google or building projects in Google Earth is is not as intuitive as I'd like it to be. I tell people it's kind of like chess. You really only have to learn about four moves, and you can build a lit trip or a math uh, or any kind of a Google Earth based project. Um, but it's you know you can take a lifetime to learn chess, and you can take a lifetime to learn how to make really really fancy. Uh, pop-up windows and, and add all of this pedagogical stuff. So on my website, the main menu at the top towards the right is called Downloads, etc. And there, there is a sub-tab called Lit Trip Tips. And so I realized right away that some, you know, teachers and students, teachers want to build these and submit them. And they also want to manage kids building them for that real hands-on engagement. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of support for managing under that downloads, etc. Uh, link. I, I also have uh, video pages where an awful lot of my step guides are being converted to just two minute videos on how to do this to support teachers. But it, you know, it's not something that you want to jump into uh, without think as a professional developer, that is, you know pedagogy, and again, it doesn't have to be literature, but you know the pedagogy, the quality of what you put out is going to be different from what a kid puts out who is learning as they do it and may not know how to ask those higher level questions. In fact, in some grade levels, it may be appropriate for that kid to just include a summary uh, because that's the skill that might be important at that, at that time. And so I have, uh, and I have a blog there. It's called Reading About Reading that, that uh, is trying to support focusing on why maintaining literature in classrooms from K to 12 graduate school is important to get it into their lives because that's where, unlike most of the internet where I can get information, literature is where I can get the wisdom to know how to use that information. There's a lot of people who have MBAs and maybe get big jobs on Wall Street and didn't read enough literature. <laughs> didn't uh, Jerome, <laughs> Jerome, uh, believe it or not, but I think we're <clears throat> we're almost out of time here. Oh my! We're, we're, we're going to need like a part two of this because we, you know, we only got like halfway through. I think uh, what we wanted to cover today, or at least what I wanted to cover. Um, um, this is uh, this is recorded and for and it's going to be on YouTube where you can watch it on this on this post or you can share it with somebody else you know that couldn't make it. Um, uh, you can find it in uh, YouTube under the, the like a Google Edu channel or something like that. Uh, and and then hopefully we can do this again in the future. I think our time limit is forty five minutes and we're close to that right now about a minute away. Mm -hmm. uh, just so that just so it fits the uh, the YouTube form you know uh, forty five minute kind of limit. That's what they want. Uh, Tom, is, is there a way for us to either continue or do a second uh, part of this and just post a link to it? In other words, I could, I don't know. 
They're going to cut I, us off in the recording. Yeah, I think I think we could uh, definitely like contact uh, Tia, and, and I think she will, uh, you know, put us on the, for another another date, uh, sometime, I guess uh, towards the end of November. You know, I mean, a couple, two or three weeks, and we'll try to promote it again and uh, kind of pick up where we left off. How does so that I sound? I figured maybe we could put it together and uh, ourselves, and uh, like you and I just do a hangout and record it somehow, and then just put a link to it where where this one is. For a finish yeah. up, I'm not so sure if people coming back, coming to a second one, would understand what we talked about in the first one. So yeah. I really want questions. You can, I, I'll keep answering questions. So if people out there have them, sure. Uh, text them to me or uh, tweet them to me. Yeah. Can we put that? I put that the hashtags on the last slide if you want to jump to that. Okay, um, I'm gonna have to look for that. I uh, want to thank people for the comments. Uh, I think we were a bit ambitious. In trying to 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 do so much uh, in 45 minutes, but uh, I'll go through and and respond to whatever I think I can respond to. If it hasn't been responded, I'll just do direct uh, contact back to those people. Yeah, excellent. So again, uh, Google it trips is is that dot com or dot org dot com, right? Actually, both, but dot com will get you more features. <laughs> Okay, and realworldmath.org. Real world uh, you can find more information about our websites, uh, obviously on the websites themselves, and you, oh, I'm sure um, you can find uh, our contact information in Google Plus and Twitter and so on. And um, yeah, I really would like to continue this conversation, and, and uh, there's some areas I'd like to, to uh, discuss uh, further with you. So um, stay alert, and we'll try to send out any kind of uh, information when we do that again. And this will so, be posted tomorrow, is that right? This will be posted probably like within an hour. It'll be there. Uh, an hour or two, it'll be. The video will be up and in YouTube. But I think I need to end the broadcast now. Okay. So, so uh, time to say goodbye. Thank you for coming. And um, thank you, Jerome, very much. Thank you, Thomas. It's been a pleasure. I hope, I hope we answered some questions and got the job. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.